Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Field. On the program today, we have Lawrence Samuels, the uh, author of Killing History, the False Left-Right Political Spectrum. We'll talk a little bit about that new book this evening. Or, yeah, this evening. Jason McPhee, an engineer for the state of California, and uh, Philip Lorea, the, uh, the uh, author of Minute Dot, a bunch of uh, published, actually published poetry, and, uh, and an, an investment advisor. Welcome to the show. So how can we kill history, or should we? Uh, well, in my, my point of view, it's already been killed. <laughs> oh, it's been killed. Okay. It's, uh, uh, are, we, uh, are, we, are we having a wake or what? Well, no. I'm trying to uh, bring out the information of, of all the... Oh, we're uh, trying to do a life assistance. We're trying to do a revival. We're trying to do a revival, bring back true history. Okay, got it. There's been a lot of historical mm -hmm. sabotage. Okay. So tell us what the sabotage is and what we can do to fix well, it. Well, actually how I got involved in my book is I, uh, I don't know if you would show it, getting uh, Mussolini's doctrine of fascism uh, because something in there wasn't, didn't seem right. You can look on the internet and there's a line in there on the internet that doesn't correlate with this. I paid 55 bucks for this, uh, 1933 Political and Social Doctrine of Fascism, authorized edition. And in that uh, uh, copy on, t on page 20, it says, uh, a century of authority, a century of the left, left it's cast, uh, capitalized, a century of fascism. You go on the internet and look at most uh, uh, of them, they'll say a century of the right, a century of ten seats to the right. That's historical sabotage. And once I found out they're willing to do a big lie, actually take a book and misquote it, what else did they do? And that's why I got it with almost 600 pages with 1,500 footnotes uh, to show uh, that the political spectrum has been distorted. And, uh, and, and sabotage. <clears throat> okay, so tell us what the political spectrum is and what it, uh, what it should be. Okay, well, I had to go back to the French Revolution. Everyone says it started in the French Revolution, and uh, it was actually the, the libertarians. Of course, at the time they were called, well, they were classical liberals, bourgeoisie, uh, artisans, merchants, capitalists. They're the ones that instigated the French Revolution. And they... Uh, uh, kicked out the king, took over the Bastille. In fact, before they went for the Bastille, they uh, destroyed a number of tax toll booths that you had to pay when you came into to Paris. And they're the first things they destroyed, then they went for the, you know, for the, for the prison. But um, what, what happened is, for three years, they controlled the French Revolution. And then you had the social uh, revolutionaries come in and uh, they wanted free education, free this, free that, and uh, and the the uh, you know the classical liberals said you know that's not a good idea, and so Robespierre put them on trial, the French twenty two French assemblymen, and had them guillotined. Put the liberal the, the classical liberals. The classical trial. liberals were twenty two of them. In fact, uh, in the history books they say it took thirty six minutes to chop up twenty two heads. But they missed one. One that was condemned was Thomas Paine. He was there. He was an elected official to, to the French Assembly, and he was part of the free market, or I call free left uh, faction, and he was scheduled to be guillotined, but he escaped. So the, so the people on so the Thomas left... So Thomas Paine was a French guy? No. Oh, okay. I've always wondered, how did he get elected? He was English. Then he comes to America. Then he goes to France and gets elected. I, I don't know. I guess loose rules. Yeah. Rules. But uh, the no, point no, no, no citizenship uh, issues. There. I guess not. Oh, okay. I mean, that's really amazing. But the point is, is that it was the, the, the classical liberals, the people on the left, who started the French Revolution. People on the right were authoritarians. And that should continue today. So that means that Hitler being an authoritarian should be on the right, but so should Stalin, Pol Pot, Mao. If you're communist, you're extreme right. You're authoritarian. Just go by the French Revolution. Now, I have two charts in the book, chart A, and that's chart A. You know, the libertarians are the left, the free left. You know, sort of like the free French, you know. What I mean? Anyway, uh, but I have a chart B, and chart B has, the, 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 everything is the same, except the um, left and the right have been exchanged. And what it says on the top is, and I got it from a major historian, the communists and socialists took, the, stole the term left from of the classical liberals and, and, their, and their revolutionary heritage. At probably somewhere around about the 1850s, 1860s, they said, we're on the left, the communists did, and anybody who's not with us is on the right. 
So the, uh, 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 chart B has that underneath it, and then we swap it. So in, in a sense, then now the libertarians on the right, the capitalists on the right, and then you know Hitler and the social democrats and communists are on the left, if you go along with that change of history. I prefer A, I prefer the original French Revolution. And libertarians should know that they are on the left. And, and I call them the free left, and anybody who's left that's kind of a commie or a fascist, Marxist, fascist, whatever they are, uh, I call them a status left. But technically, I, I'd like to see them as, as on the right. Why does it all matter? Because people know, need to know where they are. Right now, everything is confusing. I mean, how can you call people fascists when uh, they're not fascist? You know, I mean, I know it's a pejorative, but you, you know, we, should, we need to know what historical fascism is. This Antifa group is what Ant I call- Antifa, which is anti-fascist. You know, well, actually- Supposedly. Well, not according to history. I, I understand, but that's where the name comes from. That's where the name comes from. But if you know the history, and I got a number of historians said this, after World War II, or before and after World War II, a lot of the Mussolini's black shirts joined the Antifas of the time in Italy. And, and the historian said, why did they do that? Because their ideology was so close. So you actually had fascists joining so-called anti-fascists. Because if you, if you look at the historians I've looked at, they're major ones, they say fascism came out of Marxism. Um, uh, a very famous uh, uh, professor, uh, uh, Zev uh, Sternhill, says um, um, fascism is a specific uh, revision of Marxism. A.J. Uh, Greger from UC Berkeley, another professor, political uh, science, he says it's a variant, variant of Marxism is a variant of, of fascism. So uh, did Marx have uh, a fascist uh, learning curve or was it vice versa? Uh, Marx was, and there's another myth, Marx was actually a national socialist a German national socialist. He, there's many quotes from him that says, uh, we gotta go to water Russia for the honor of Germany. He was a pan-German. He believed in, in Germany being unified. It is like from- so, the, Sort of like the, Hitler. Like Hitler. He wanted to take these areas and force them into the German empire. He hated Jews. Marx hated Jews, just like Hitler. I mean, I often call uh, Hitler the son of Marx because they're so close. I don't know where this international stuff comes from, but, uh, but Marx was very nationalistic, very uh, pro-German race, uh, very anti-Jew, very anti-capitalist. The reason the Marxists and the fascists don't like Jews because they're, they're the people, they're a merchant society. They believe in trade, financing, and of course, lending money out for interest. And, I, and, and if you're a socialist, going back to the beginning, 1820, if you're a socialist, you're really automatically an anti-Semitic. You have to be, because they all said the Jews were bad. I take every one of the utopian ones, I talk about uh, um, uh, Marx and his, what he said about Jews and beyond and all. I mean, it's just, in fact, Hitler made the statement in the 20, 1920 speech. He says, if you're, first he says, we're all socialists, you know, national socialists. And then he says, if you're a socialist, how can you not be anti-Jew? How, how can you not be anti-Semitic? Because to him, Jews were, cap were capitalists, Jewish capitalists. And so, you know, the whole spectrum is just, you know, but if you put, you know, so, it's social democracy next to national, uh, national socialism and in communism, you know, and the most extreme is communism, it makes sense. Well, okay, uh, so, so there's not a dime's worth of difference in the philosophy of, of a fascist and a socialist. Uh, well, there's always differences. There's difference between fascism and national socialism, but generally they're, they're come from the same basically, source. Basically the same mindset. Same source, okay. Take, okay, I mean, so yeah. why then did we see Fascists and socialists going to war with each other. Because Stalin, they always Stalin go to German. war. Communists okay. always killing communists. Socialists always killing socialists. Look at uh, Red China attacking communist uh, North Vietnam. North, communist North Vietnam attacks uh, Cambodia. I mean, on and on. There are three communist groups fighting for control of Russia in 1917. They're, they're called the Third Russian Revolution. You had uh, Men Mensovic and Socialist Revolutionary Party members in an army of 2,000 people attacking Lenin's Kremlin with, with machine guns and artillery. That was happening all through, uh, all through uh, Russia. It's called the Third Russian Revolution. And they're always killing each other. Okay, so then it would sound to me like it really comes down to 
lust for power. Uh, we want to have the power. We will use a uh, socialist or fascist or whatever you want to okay. call it uh, uh, ideology to bring people to our side. Okay. The thing, thing is what they call now total like identity prop uh, entity at identity politics and tribalism. If you're a collectivist and all these people on the extreme are collectivists, you all have to believe the same. That's why Russia had uh, was uh, having problems with Red China. Red China was agrarian socialism. Their 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 socialism was a little bit different. There were massive battles between Red China and the Soviet Union. In fact, the Soviet Union called uh, Mao a fascist. Mao called uh, uh, the Russians a uh, uh, fascist. I mean, it's just. <laughs> well, you know, I, I wonder if some of the confusion comes from uh, the uh, the professed um, uh, what do you call it. Uh, I guess that the motives that they're claiming they're for, and, and almost every time they're always claiming they're for the people, but we as sort of free market guys understand that that almost always devolves into central planning and therefore somebody has to be in charge and then here comes the dictator. Well, yeah, so, and they don't believe in choice. So you can have Trotsky's and Stalin is killing each other. Remember, Stalin killed Trotsky in, in Spain, had him, you know, eyes picked through the eye or something. He killed almost all the Trotsky's in Spain during the... Uh, the Spanish uh, Civil War. I mean, Stalin actually was more concerned about killing the Trotskyites than going after Franco. Well, I mean, I it's incredible. It's so interesting, uh, you know, where the words do matter, and you brought the word collectivism as being the hallmark yes. of what was once a considered conservatism. It was monarchy, it was feudalism. Yeah. That was the conservative, Alexander, the Hamiltonian philosophy. Mm -hmm. And that liberalism had a body of literature, John Locke and Joseph Priestley That's right. had been, you know, on and on and on. And it essentially was characterized by the right of the individual mm -hmm. uh, as superseding government. So that the word liberal meant individualism. That's right. Individual freedom. Individual. And yet, when we use the word liberal today, we always mean collectivism, and we always use words like the common good, the greater good, the, uh, well, uh, and we use the word conservative when somebody stands up for individual civil liberties. Collectivists are really involved. You want to make it really simple. Think of a collectivist who believes in a, um, a theocracy. They always are stealing everything. They steal your words, your ideas, your land, your property, <laughs> everything. They take gold out of your teeth. They can say they don't believe in private property. The main thing of John Locke. He's, Locke says you can't have freedom unless you have the right to private property. So, um, you know, in, in continental Europe, if you're a liberal, you're still the classical liberal. It's just changed in America, England, and Canada. It was a difference. And there was a, a particular reason why it changed. And that's because all these socialists came over to America, mostly intellectuals, turn of the century, 1900s. And, uh, and they started in, like, uh, what is it, uh, San Francisco, New York, and Chicago. And they're trying to promote socialism. It didn't work. People, Americans didn't like the word socialism. So they went and started infiltrating into, le into liberal groups and started taking over the word liberalism. But which, they always still. Okay. Okay. Well, one of the things that I find interesting is that uh, <coughs> collectivists, whether they're from the left or from the right, use fear tactics and, use, and, and try mm -hmm. to set up a, uh, a, uh, a scapegoat for every, everything that's wrong oh, for, yes. for the common guy. And, I, I, I was fascinated during the, the 2016 campaign yeah. by people calling in uh, on the unfiltered C-SPAN uh, Washington Journal in the morning. Uh -huh. I get up early and I watch Washington's Journal. I'm a junkie, I'm a nerd, I, I realize that. Mm -hmm. But people would get up and people and the moderator would you know, be taking calls and people would say, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't like the way things are going in this country, you know, the, America's in, a, in bad shape and I'm gonna vote for change. I just haven't made up my mind whether I'm going to vote for Bernie or for Trump, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it, it, they're both mining from the same fertile. It's the field. same from the fertile. Well, you got to remember, uh, you know, uh, Trump was a Democrat for most of his life, yeah. and uh, he's changed a lot of his policies since. He was running well with Clinton. He was supporting Hillary in two thousand eight, and he, he would say crazy things back then. But since he was running around with the Democrats and in, in, in the Clintons. They didn't really want, they didn't want, the media didn't want to talk about it. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's funny too because we go back 
for eight years, and we hear Democrats saying some of the exact same things Trump's saying today, and lo and behold, it's sacrilege when Trump says it, but when they said it, it yeah, was it's, just, it's you know. crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. I, 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 I thought particularly in 2016 when it was Romney and Obama, and they were debating, and you couldn't put a piece of paper between their policy. You know, one would say, I'm going to war, and the other would say, well, I'll war harder. You know, you want Obamacare? <laughs> I invented it. I mean, you, you the, the two went back and forth, and, you know, there was literally no difference between them. And, uh, you know, to that idea, there is no difference between a Republican and a Democrat that uh, uh, is a dime for the difference. Okay, and, and, of course, we have a, a bipolar, I'm sorry, a bipartisan, <laughs> I call it a bipolar system, where, <laughs> where two parties basically control. Uh, you've got, the, you've got uh, totalitarians on the right called Republicans, totalitarians on the left called Democrats. Both of them are interested in gaining the levers of power so they can reward their friends and hurt their enemies. That's kind of what government is all about. Which makes it very difficult for libertarians, which is most of us, if you, you know, if truth be told, just want to be left alone by the government to, you know, mm -hmm. make a living, pursue our, our, our own individual dreams, and, you know, and, you know, just live well and prosper. But we're not interested, most libertarians, <coughs> most individualists, are not particularly interested in gaining power for power's sake, not interested in controlling other people's lives. But our lives are being controlled by the authoritarians, by the sociopaths that uh, make up most of the politicians of both the Democratic and the Republican Party. How do you, how do you, how do you fight that? Well, I, I really, I think uh, the, the market, the individual, I, I, you know, I'm a financial advisor, I sit at a lot of kitchen tables and hear people, you know, kind of figure out what they want to do based on their values. And so the answer may not be political in the sense that the ballot box, but every time someone makes a spending decision, it's a political decision. How so? Well, because if we refuse to buy something and therefore a tax isn't collected on it, and the government has been counting on that tax, and a great example of what's going on in the um, auto industry, uh, the cost of ownership in California has gotten so high that it has become, and this is the registration tax, the small gain tax, the gasoline tax, you know, go right down the line with it, that it has become more cost effective to have other kinds of technology really take root. Lyft, Uber, Zipcar, scooters, you name it. They even have this sort of um, auto Airbnb where I'm an owner of a car, I don't use it between three and five, I'll rent it to you. And so we build up this underground market. Uh, another great example, seems harmless enough, but um, when you think about how we have become a kind of a barter society, you look at all these fun websites, the let goes, the offer ups, the uh, you know, you name it. They're all over the web, and what's really happening? Next is, door, Carmelo, or whatever your neighborhood is. Yeah, exactly. I've got Arden Arcade. Uh, so what am I doing when I buy a car or a piece of jewelry from somebody else? There's no sales tax. So you go down the line, cryptocurrency being the, the biggest threat to, to all of that. There is no connection between buyer and seller that the government can say you owe me income as having sold it and you owe me sales tax for having bought it. So the market way underneath the economy is uh, really subverting it. Uh, and so we libertarians probably don't exist right now in the political ballot box world. We get out there with our ideas and we should, but where we really exist is in communities. And so I say that uh, uh, libertarians, more people are libertarian in their practice than they are in their political life. And that's how we fight it. So make, make, make yourself heard by doing business with Nextdoor rather than with uh, Amazon or Walmart. And every single, uh, you know, when we talk about a um, uh, kitchen table discussion about whether to buy or sell a home and whether I should sell my home and buy another home or not, and so when I get to these discussions, people always sort of vote. They say, okay, look, this is in the best interest of my family. Not evil, not selfishness. This is just in the best interest of my family. And what ends up, what I find in a lot of those discussions is that they look at the world, they look at the tax code, they look at uh, you know, the authoritarianism around them. Many, many, I mean, there is, we see it now demographically, there is an exodus from California. California lost a million people over the last decade. That was those were the brown years. So people, we, we think that we are making independent decisions that no one else is, but in fact we are that, as Jung might call it, the collective unconscious, that we are all doing the same things for the same reasons that all plays out on a macro scale 
So ultimately, every time we pull out our wallet or don't pull out our wallet, it is a political act. That is our most. Are you saying that ultimately the market always wins? It might take yes. a while, but it always wins. Yes. That, that's what's kind of sad, though, is that disconnect. Because, like you said, it's unconscious. People are essentially behaving like you know rational actors for the most part in the, in the, in the market, but they're they've got a complete disconnect about their political philosophy with their everyday actions. And that's what's so sad about it, because then they keep working against themselves by voting for all these promises that they're being given. Well, you know, I think we, we can be kind of cynical or satirical about that. Sure, sure. What seems to happen is people are quite willing to vote someone else's rights away. Yes, someone exactly. else's money away. You know, that's it's only fair. the other guy who's bad. Exactly. I, will, I will always vote for a free lunch for, for myself. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Well, uh, the IRS uh, has eyes in the sky and uh, ears on the internet and you, you name it, and they are very, very uh, aggressive and, and uh, uh, interested in figuring out how to collect their, it's not their due because they're stealing it, but how to collect the money that they think they have rightfully stolen. And one of the things uh, that they're using now is that if you owe the IRS more by their definition, more than $52,000 in back taxes, unpaid taxes, you lose your passport. So you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> right? Well, sure. And I, I, you know, the, the, the kind of sad thing about this is where this is going to create a lot of confusion is that when people are traveling and they're out of the country, they may not know that, you know, they have a situation with the IRS. And then when they try to come back, they find out they have a situation <laughs> where they can't enter without their passport. I think is part of the problem. So they actually. Well, I thought have it was to, more about not letting people out of the well, country. I think that there's a, there's an issue in both directions. So I mean, but I, I think the so more you, serious. So you're a man issue, without the country if, you, if yeah, you're out of the country and haven't paid your taxes. And so from what I was reading in the article, it was saying that you know some people their their work visas and other things like that are tied to that when they're going out of the country. But uh, this may not affect their ability to work outside the country, but it will affect their ability to come back until they pay off those. <laughs> so, so I mean, well, for so some people, what they're doing is they're creating a hell of an incentive not to come back. Potentially, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I can certainly see, you know, I mean, my gosh, you know, people going back and forth across the border of Mexico every day may not be wealthy people, and then suddenly finding out, you know, that you may not be able to come back in without a substantial, you know, burden. So I, I, I don't know. It's it's one of those things where. Um, you know, there, there may be some consequences down the line that they haven't been looking at too carefully. So. Well, to me, the, you know, this is uh, the passport issue being central, uh, also as a form of ID, goes back to what I think was the most egregious abuse of that, which is the driver's license. So if you want to cripple somebody, what do you do? You suspend their license. You, you can't live without your license. And uh, how, how that has been, you know, the, the bludgeon is particularly used against the poor take away your license and now you're driving illegally and now you're in prison and now you've got fines and your life your life and your family's yeah, well, life is happens destroyed. everywhere licensing yeah you're basically saying uh, I can't work unless the government uh, gives me approval yeah it's and I can't leave the license. country now now I can't now, leave now the country. I can't leave the country too yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know that's been the whole thing of uh, you know I, I I absolutely believe that when Jefferson said the pursuit of happiness he meant two things literally the right to mobility and the right to pursue what was originally known as property, but it was Locke had written as property. Right. And so that those were not one thing, pursuit of happiness was not one thing, it is the right to pursue mobility yeah. and the right to your happiness. And we have largely in this society used the, uh, the threat of taking away your right to mobility as the way to destroy your life. Yeah, and property. So yeah, you bought both of them. One of, one of the uh, one places in the world where we've had a, 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 a an historical demonstration of the uh, the uh, success of market capitalism or, or free markets mm -hmm. uh, versus uh, the uh, not so successful uh, model of uh, totalitarian communism is is Hong Kong versus uh, mainland China. Uh, Hong Kong was run by the British by a British. Uh, governor, I guess it was, that was very much a uh, laissez-faire, free market capitalist, essentially no laws at all other than, you know, force and fraud kind of things. You don't hurt people, don't take their stuff, other than that anything goes. That's Hong Kong's heritage. <coughs> that's what Hong Kong, uh, that's how Hong Kong became an entrepot trading uh, nation uh, that, uh, you know, is really the envy of the world in, in per capita income, mm -hmm. in prosperity, you know, all of those things. Uh, when Hong Kong uh, went back to China uh, in, uh, toward the end of the, uh, of the 20th century, uh, 
it was kind of a, you know, it's, it's now a Chinese city, but you can live by your own rules. Except maybe not so much. Now, uh, Hong Kong, uh, at the behest of, of the uh, Taiwanese and the, the mainland Chinese, wants to uh, make it possible to extradite Hong Kong citizens to uh, China. And the Hong Kong want none of that. And they're, you know, they're, they're, they're protesting in the streets, protesting in the airport. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, Chinese government is massing at the border and making threatening noise uh, in, in Chinese media. Where is that going? Is, that, is this a demonstration of, of uh, libertarian sentiments against oppressive government yeah, uh, in it, its it, rawest form? It, yeah. it is. And the, the, for China, uh, th th that had always been sort of the release valve for the ultra-rich in China. And you know, yeah, you you know, so much of a good background. Um, China is all uh, Hong Kong is also considered one of the most important financial markets in the world. If you want to trade Chinese stock, you don't trade it on the Shanghai Composite, which is China. You trade it on the Hang Seng, which is Hong Kong. Uh, as you say, it's a small country. Uh, uh, it's a, got a popul in, in its tiny little space, uh, the most densely populated place in the world per capita, and it has a population the size of it. You know. 50% more than Ireland, uh, Denmark, Holland, uh, you know, all of the happy places on earth. And as you say, it's got the highest per capita income of any place on earth. Uh, and, and the most capitalistic, uh, as you say, just, you know, anything goes. So this was sort of the release. This is where the Chinese could go, who were, you know, all the, the billionaire Chinese could go and enjoy their wealth. And that was sort of the uneasy truth that China would allow Hong Kong to exist as long as you know it was only over there, and uh, uh, this ability to extradite that was the lightning rod. Now you know Hong Kong, any Hong Kong Hong Konger feels like anytime China wants, they can recall them, and you know whatever will happen in mainland China, and this is a. a so in country. other words, you could you could violate uh, a Chinese law that's perfectly legal in Hong Kong, and you're dead meat. And and Hong Kong has no real culture with um, uh, at least communist China or anything like that. It was a British colony yeah. in, in the middle of China, um, and so the culture is completely different. It's completely capitalistic, freedom loving culture, uh, uber freedom loving culture, more than perhaps any place in the world. Uh, should be all of a sudden have have the collar thrown on them, and they consider this an existential threat. And so, yes, there will be blood in the streets. This will not be resolved in uh, mainland China's favor. It can't be. Okay, but they have the guns. I mean, well, uh, they have the guns, but Hong Kong has the financial, financial the international yeah. financial market. Yeah. And there's a lot of important things that go on in Hong Kong uh, relative to the rest of the world. Yeah. I think it's the seventh largest financial market in the well, world. One of the banners that they were proudly displaying was, we need a second amendment. And uh, yes, <laughs> I, I heartily agree with that. Thank you, yes. gentlemen, for being on the show this week. We'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint, uh, Channel 17 in Sacramento, uh, YouTube, Facebook, and uh, www. Sacramento or access sacramento.org. Channel 17. Thank you. Oh, yeah.